Hey guys, so, um, time for another Friday Reads. Um, Wednesday was my last official obligation, uh, of the semester, so I'm officially done with my first year of my PhD program, which is a nice feeling, uh, and I will have a lot more time in the coming months to read, obviously. Um, I do, I do have to get work done, I have to work on projects, uh, over the summer, I, it's not like I can just, uh, do absolutely nothing relating to school, um, but I will have a lot more free time, uh, and the projects I will be working on may not necessarily take, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, so I, uh, certainly plan to get a lot of reading done. Um, so the first book I want to talk about is one that I don't have, uh, because I returned it to the library. Um, Possessed by Memory by Harold Bloom. Um, I really just, uh, looked ahead to 400 more pages of what I had already read, and didn't find the idea enticing, um, yeah, and it, it didn't help that I was on the section of the book where he talks about Shakespeare, and again, Harold Bloom on Shakespeare is a bit of a mixed bag, um, but yeah, I just realized that I wasn't quite enjoying the book that much, um, I know I praised it on my channel, but, uh, I just realized that, um, relative to the other books that I have that I'm going to talk about, I wasn't getting that much out of it, or liking it that much, um, and, and another part of that is just because I started to get really into the books I'm going to be talking about, um, so, yeah, and I may read the book at some point, I may finish it at some point in, in the future, but, um, for now, I'm more interested in, in these other books I'm going to be talking about, and there are other books by Harold Bloom that I will read, I'm still interested in him as an author, but, um, anyway, to talk about the books that I actually did work on this week, uh, the first is Plain Water by Anne Carson. This is a collection of her poems and essays. Um, I did mention it last week. It was published in 2004, and, um, yeah, I, uh, sort of had some mixed feelings last Friday, um, because I was liking the prose more than the poetry. Um, there was one extended poem, Canicula Diana, which I, I liked, or at least I found it kind of interesting and will probably revisit it. Um, the piece that I ran into is a long essay, the piece that I've been working on reading this week, that is, is, um, a long essay, long, long essay, like 50 pages, about, uh, uh, Anne Carson's, um, pilgrimage to Compostela, which I understand is a, is a major pilgrimage site in Spain for Catholics. I think it has, like, a shrine of a saint or something. I'm not really sure. It's not that important to the essay. Um, this essay is mostly about just travel and pilgrimage and the nature of travel and pilgrimage and sort of, it seems like she's sort of using this pilgrimage as a sort of metaphor for life, I suppose. Um, I'm not really sure. That's part of, again, why I, I'm, I, I'm perhaps not liking it as much because I don't quite feel like I, I get what's going on or, you know, what's, what she's saying in these, in this essay. So the essay is divided into little, little sections, um, they're like, it's written like sort of in a diary format, so like, you'll have a, the date, the place where she's at, um, an epigraph, which is usually a short poem or a piece of prose by, um, a Japanese writer I've never heard of, uh, and then she'll have a short piece of prose about some idea she had that day with regards to being on her pilgrimage and um some of it is interesting i you know some of the i've found some quotes that i've liked from this essay but on the whole i don't really know what i'm getting out of it um i'm not all that interested in going on a pilgrimage to compostela and uh i'm i mean i yeah i don't know i can't i feel like again sort of with that long poem i don't quite know what is going on in it, or what I'm supposed to be getting from it, um, or whether I'm getting much from it, so I don't know, but, um, I'm gonna soldier through, I've been reading, the, uh, the nice thing about it is that it is in that, like, diary format, so I can just read, like, one or two entries per day, it's not like I, it's not like a, uh, an extended essay where it's all one unit, um, so, uh, yeah, I've been reading that very slowly, just because I haven't been finding it all that interesting, um, but the next two I have really been liking. So the first is, uh, The Landmark, uh, Campaigns of Alexander by Arian. Um, this, uh, the, this translation is by Pamela Mensch. Um, this volume is edited by James Rom, and there is an introduction by Paul Cartledge. This volume was published in, um, sh shall we have a drum roll? Um, 2010. 
And um, this is a part of a series, the Landmark series. There's, uh, there's a Landmark Herodotus, a Landmark Thucydides, uh, a Landmark Julius Caesar, um, and the Landmark Xenophon, which I also talked about last Friday. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, the Campaigns of Alexander are just about that. The Campaigns of Alexander the Great to conquer Persia and then much of Central Asia and then um, a part of what is today uh, Pakistan, uh, which he knew as, as India. Um, and uh, this volume is just great. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of footnotes um, where footnotes belong at the foot of the page, not at the back of the book where you have to constantly flip back and forth. Um, you have uh, photos throughout of... Um, let's see, oh, okay, here we go. Um, you have photos of, you know, uh, important places or um, you also have photographs of, like, weapons that were used. Uh, I can't, I'm probably not going to be able to find one. Um, specifically, but you have, like, things like that, like a picture of a phalanx, um, to explain to you what a phalanx is. You have maps throughout, um, uh, can I find one? Yep, you have maps throughout, which is important in a, in a military history, because military history involves a lot of moving around through places, and especially when you're someone like me who, um, doesn't have necessarily the best, um, spatial intelligence, uh, it's easy to sort of lose, lose track of, uh, what's going on, uh, in, in, uh, military campaigns and such, um, and I'm trying to see if I can find, um, one other thing that I particularly like, there's, um, also maps that are like, ah, here we go, um, like diagrams for battles, uh, battle sequences. So, um, like you have the blue here is Alexander the Great's army. The gray is, uh, the army of Darius, the king of Persia. And, uh, these arrows sort of tell you who goes where and, and what happens. And, like, the, the, the units are all sort of labeled. Um, and the arrows are labeled with, uh, A, B, C, D. And, um, right here you'll, well, you can't see that. Right here you have, um, some pieces of, of, um, prose that are labeled with A, B, C, D, and they tell you what those arrows mean, um, and the sequence in which they happened, um, and that's great, because, uh, military tactics are very interesting, uh, but I find it difficult to read about them, because, again, I don't do, I don't do great with, like, processing spatial relations, especially through reading, uh, so having a visual guide like that is, is awesome. Um, so I, I'm really liking this, um, I probably liked the first half or so more than I am currently liking the second half. Um, I do find that the Alexander the Great story loses a lot of its uh, sort of high drama uh, after he conquers the Persian Empire and uh, Darius, King Darius, is, is killed. Um, just because, you know, there are so many you know, legendary battles there. You have the Battle of Galgamela, which is super, which is incredible. You have the Battle of Issus and uh, the Battle of Tyre, where Alexander the Great builds a, like, has a makeshift bridge built to Tyre to conquer it, because Tyre is the city that's sort of just off the coast um, and surrounded by water. Um, and you have just all these really cool battles. Uh, but then once Persia is conquered then it's kind of just like, okay, then Alexander and his army went and conquered this tribe in Central Asia, then they went and conquered this tribe, then they went and conquered this tribe. And then, oh, he took a wife named Roxana from this one particular tribe. Um, and then he decided to invade India because he felt like it. Um, and um, so I, I, I'm feeling I'm not liking the second half quite as much as the first half. Um, but I, I love reading about Alexander and... Um, uh, the campaign in India does tend to be kind of interesting, because there are some, uh, sort of close calls there. There was one battle where Alexander the Great is almost killed, um, and one where he, uh, isn't necessarily almost killed, but does almost lose the battle. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, anyway, I'm still really liking it. I'm gonna finish it, uh, either I will just, like, finish it, like, early in the coming week, or I will just sort of read it slowly, like, ten pages at a time and finish it by the end of the month or something. Um... But, uh, whoop, the cat has entered. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, another great thing about this book, um, is the translation is really, really modern. Like, based on the prose in this translation would, um, make it difficult to believe that this is a book from, that was written in 2nd century, uh, Greece. Um, so I've been really liking that. It makes it very easy to read. Um, and the, and the footnotes, again, I mentioned the footnotes earlier, but the foot, the content of those footnotes, not just the fact that they're 
where they belong, but the fa the content of them is excellent. They, you know, they tell you where Arian contradicts himself, or where what he's saying doesn't really make sense, or where what he says contradicts um, another source that we have, or where perhaps he's perhaps he's bending the truth and and things of that sort, and just explains things that you might not know. Um, like what a certain type of soldier is, or or something of that sort. Um, so yeah, this is just a great volume. I yeah, I mean, if you're looking to read these old uh, Greek and Roman historians, I think that these landmark volumes are probably uh, the way to go. Um, there aren't landmark volumes for every one of those old historians, um, but you know they have Herodotus and Thucydides and obviously Arian. So um, yeah, anyway, I'm I'm really liking this. Um, but my Book of the week, probably, because I'm just really loving it, is uh, The Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan, um, where he just, you know, uh, takes a, rips a page out of Thucydides' book and tells uh, the story of the Peloponnesian War, and um, it starts, the, starts in the exact same place as Thucydides, um, with the uh, inciting incident of the war, and just uh, goes through all the twists and turns of this really fascinating conflict. You know, it's, um, you know, the Peloponnesian War is... Uh, a, a really important event in history, uh, it's not really an event, but a really important occurrence in history, you know, it took place over 30 years, that's why I'm saying it's not really an event, um, but it's just fascinating, and it, it's weird, because it, it feels like it shouldn't be all that fascinating, because there's not, in the Peloponnesian War, there's no, like, huge battle that happens, there's no one central battle, like, with the campaigns of Alexander, you have the Battle of Galgamela, which is, or, or the Battle of Issus, which are these you know, epic battles where this, where Alexander the Great was leading this, you know, army of 40,000 or so Greeks and or, and Macedonians against an army of, like, 300 or 400,000 Persians, um, and that's just this epic, uh, almost m mythic, or at least, um, uh, a battle that would inspire mythology, uh, you know, that's just an epic battle. There there aren't battles like that in the Peloponnesian War. There's no central battle. There are no huge armies uh, facing off against each other. It's a lot of, you know, diplomatic politics, a lot of bickering between different factions um, within uh, Sparta and within Athens, but also between them, of course. Um, and a lot of really small battles that happen. But it's just, it's really fascinating. And Donald Kagan does a great job. You know, um, he um, is occasionally critical of Thucydides. You know, sometimes Thucydides is not entirely um, objective. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I, I mean, he just does a great job of making this a really fun, narr well, fun to the extent that you can have fun reading about a war. But he makes it really enjoyable to read and really easy to read. Um, and, you know... A, a sense I get from this, the, the the way I want to describe the way that he talks about this war is he talks about it as though he's a teacher explaining it, um, which, you know, uh, but, which, which could come off as condescending, I feel like, almost, but it doesn't at all. It just comes off as very, um, balanced and, like, he's really trying to just help you to understand what this war was about and what was going on, um... So yeah, I'm really liking this, and after having read Thucydides earlier this year, um, I can say that Donald Kagan is much easier, much more enjoyable reading. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, and then um, another book I'm going to be reading a little bit from, it's not not really um, a major reading project or anything, but I have uh, the definitive Kobe's opera book, uh, edited, revised, and updated by the Earl of Harewood. Um, don't know who that is, but, uh, this is just a huge, uh, book of, uh, basically plot summaries of operas, and also, um, occasionally you'll have, uh, things where it'll actually take you through some of the music, some of the major, uh, passages of music and some of the arias, uh, of each opera that's in here, and this has a ton of operas. I mean, I think it has more operas than are really in the repertoire at the moment, um, you know, because there's, like, five, six pages of a table of contents, um, but yeah, so this just has plot summaries and, again, uh, summaries of the music, uh, and, um, the reason I might be, I I'm gonna be reading from this is because tomorrow I am gonna go, uh, to another live broadcast at the movie theater here, and, uh, uh this time I'm going to see, uh, The Dialogues of the Carmelites by Francis Poulenc, um, at this point all I know is the premise, um, or at least I think I know the premise. It's about a group of nuns who, um, 
uh, in France during the French Revolution, when there was a lot of anti-religious, anti-Catholic sentiment uh, going around. Um, and I've heard that it's a devastating opera, so uh, I uh, I will be reading about the story before going to see the opera. Because it it is important to, I think, be familiar with the story of an opera before going to see it, because I think it can sometimes be hard to keep track of the story when you're also trying to enjoy the music. Um, and also, I think trying to keep track of the story sort of distracts you from enjoying the music sometimes. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so I'll be reading from that as well. Um, yeah, and I haven't read that much poetry this week, um, not for any particular reason, just haven't uh, been feeling it that much. Um, I will try to uh, over the course of the next week, but yeah, anyway, that's all for now. Um, I hope you're all having a nice Friday. I hope you all have a good weekend. Let me know what you're reading, and uh, if um, you've read or are reading or have or want to read any of these books, let me know. Give me your thoughts, and uh, yeah, I'll talk to you all in my next video. Bye, guys.